Welcome to a special five-part podcast series sponsored by K2 Integrity. In this podcast series, we will consider the intersection of compliance, due diligence, and mergers and acquisitions. We will look at issues relating to core due diligence, concerns in deal making, potential reputational issues, deals through a global lens, and integration issues. In this series, I'm joined by Hannah Coleman, Managing Director in K2 Integrity's Investigations and Risk Advisory Practices. She specializes in fast-moving complex and specialized research assignments in a variety of areas, including investigative due diligence, corporate contests, intellectual property investigations, media transparency assessments, and litigation support. We also have Tom Pinnell, Managing Director in K2 Integrity's Investigations and Risk Advisory Practice. With a focus on financial investigations, Tom leads the multidisciplinary teams working with corporate clients and their legal advisors responding to crisis events, including multi-jurisdictional, white-collar crime, misconduct, financial fraud statements, anti-bribery and corruption incidents, and compliance advisory work. In this fourth episode, I'm joined again by Tom Pinnell. We take a look at global trends and international transactions. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again for another episode in our exploration of compliance, diligence, and mergers and acquisitions with K2 Integrity. Today, I have back with me Tom Pinnell. Tom is Managing Director at K2 Integrity. And today, we're going to take a look at deals with a global lens. So, Tom, first of all, welcome back. Great to be here, Tom. Thank you. Uh, Tom, even in the pandemic uh, world of uh, 2020 to 2021, the nature of business is increasingly global. What are some of the things that you would advise a client to consider from a diligence perspective on a truly a global deal or a multinational deal? Obviously, if you're entering into a multinational global deal, you're a fairly sophisticated buyer, but you're, the ultimate level of risk of the transaction is going to inform what you do. Hannah touched on f- familiarity in our last session. So obviously, if you know the industry well, you might think that you might be able to shortcut a couple of things because of your background knowledge. But um, I think doing a fulsome diligence is key and and really let the target, the profile of the target, drive the activities that you're going to do. Look at the track record of the target. L- look at the, the what they actually do. If it's slightly different than what you do as a as an acquirer, it, they might pose a little bit different risks than you're used to. Who do they sell to? Where are the customers located versus their business operations? Is it a distributor model? Do they use third parties? Uh, are governments involved? And then you need to to really understand their supply chain and where the the underlying goods are for them to produce whatever they produce and uh, ultimately deliver it out to their to the to the end customers. So you really need to understand the risks around the underlying supply chain and, and what that could bring. Look at their facilities, look at their suppliers, understand all those types of things. When conducting a due diligence on a high risk deal, what are some of the other things that you look at other than investigative diligence, Tom? We're going to touch on, or I'm going to touch on a handful of areas where K2 can really help clients dig through their risks and address the risk present. As I said a minute ago, the ultimate deal is what's driving the diligence that you need. So obviously, you don't always need all of this diligence. Anti-money laundering is a big, hot area. The new rules that just came out around beneficial owners is important. But ultimately, you're in the business and you're expanding globally, you're going to want to look at your the the target's AML program. So if you're a bank uh, expanding your global footprint, buying another bank in another jurisdiction where you don't necessarily have operations and you don't know it, you want to dig into their AML compliance program. So there you're going to look at the governance. You're going to look at the customer due diligence and KYC policies and procedures and controls then you're going to see how that fits into the overall control environment. And then you want to spend time on training and understand, do they have a capable team that actually understands the AML risks that they're subject to? And is that program, that training program broad enough to cover the risks that, that you have as well, if there are additional risks that, that 
your jurisdiction brings in to operate into that jurisdiction? And then ultimately, has anybody actually evaluated if that operation works? Because you don't want to end up buying a foreign bank and have a huge look back on your hand because you were you bought something that, that really didn't smell very good. Um, another area that's quite interesting to me really is CFIUS. It's a cool acronym, but it's also an interesting name. It, that's the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. The focus of CFIUS is foreign investment in the U.S. where it's acquiring sensitive technologies or data uh, that could have national security implications. So national security is obviously incredibly important. And CFIUS is a the tool that the president can actually enact in reviewing deals that might have a national security interest. Really quite interesting. Um, so any transaction can actually be subject to it. And there are many transactions that have failed from roadblocks that the government has thrown up on it. For example, Alibaba was unable to purchase MoneyGram because of that. TikTok, you've all heard about that, I'm sure, is still dealing with CFIUS issues and haven't gotten through that because of the sensitivity around is Americans' data going to China? So the China Chinese government and Chinese acquirers have been a big target of that. So from a U.S. target perspective, we can help clients really understand if what they're doing is going to be subject to a CFIUS review potentially by the government. We have this the expertise in-house to really look at, does what they do potentially have a national security interest? How does their technology work within, within their data to, to preserve national security? That sort of pivots to cyber diligence, crazy important these days because of the impact of the pandemic and the distributed workforce. So now everybody's uh, computer is a location for a company, basically. So you went from having five principal places of business to having 5,000 principal places of business. Doing diligence, you need to, to probably broaden what you did historically. You know, malware continues to be a problem. Business email compromises continue to happen. The phishing uh, where you trick somebody into wiring millions of dollars because you're the CEO and needs a quick wire to uh, a friend in the Cayman Islands. Um, and, and people fall for that. And they continue to fall for that. So the key there is, um, is their training for that. So from diligence perspective, in this case, you're going to focus on governance again and access rights and controls, um, data loss prevention, activities, vendor management, who actually has your data and what are they doing with your data and how are they protecting it? And then again, training um, your people are the biggest vulnerability. So when you're doing cyber diligence, you're going to be reviewing the training program and seeing what's going on. When an incident happens, you need to figure out, does this, does this target have an incident response program? So I'll take a breath there before we really jump into a topic that's near and dear to to your typical audience, I think, and that's anti-corruption compliance diligence, right? You you do a lot on that, right, Tom? I do a lot on that. A fair amount of the audience is going to be interested in that. But I wondered, while you're telling us a little bit about that, uh, one of the things I've seen cause transactions and m and to fail the most is around culture and culture fit. And how do you have that conversation with your client and how do you help them assess culture uh, between two organizations, even if it's a, a friendly or, you know, a non-adversarial deal? And what are, I guess, your thoughts around that issue that, that may seem more squishy than, than analytical? Yes, culture is a big challenge. Um, and, and really, the interesting thing there is is from a cultural norms perspective and and that does will bring it will pivot back to to anti-corruption diligence an american company going into new markets where they've never been before their compliance department probably is experienced but maybe haven't seen some of the day-to-day operational risks and cultural norms of how to work within that context culture is 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 critical from a cultural norm perspective that people don't always do business the same way. So business in 
in the U.S. is very different than business in sub-Saharan Africa. It's very different than business in Asia. Looking at common practices is critical. Pivot back to um, anti-corruption compliance, diligence as, as a key part of diligence in a global deal and what you're going to do. The main drivers are really geographic risk, which touches on your cultural norms uh, piece, sector risk, regulatory risk, operating risks. As you're making these acquisitions, like 10 years ago, there wasn't much to go on when you're making a, an, an acquisition in, in a developing market. Um, but now, more and more companies do know if they want to be a target of a, of a global organization, they do need to have some sort of compliance program in place. So from a, an anti-corruption perspective, you're going to want to look at their, the compliance program they have in place. Is it a paper program? And in some geographies, you might end up there. But in a lot of cases, you're going to have a real program in place. So you're going to look at their policies and procedures. You're going to try to understand the tone. Does it have a code of conduct? Is there an ethics policy? Um, look at the historic practices and historic issues. And that's where the investigative diligence that Hannah talked about can really find some great red flags that should be followed up on during diligence. Who has responsibility for the program? Look at the, the training program. I know I touched on training now multiple times, but training is actually really, really important. Who's delivering the training? Who's being trained? Do third parties get trained? So there's all those those key. Um, but ultimately, from an anti-corruption compliance, um, anti-corruption compliance diligence perspective, what I find we typically do more so in, in a deal than anywhere else in the deal diligence is we're testing transactions and we're digging into the underlying substance of the transaction. We're just not looking at trends. The trends help, you know, find the smoke, but we're looking at deep in the smoke and, and, and trying to really dig in to see if there's an issue. It is diligence. It's not an investigation. So we're not doing a hundred percent, but you can find a lot in a, in a really targeted uh, review of different types of, of uh, travel expenses or gifts or your key distributors or your key third parties. You can do a lot in, with, with a little bit of transaction testing. So in an in m and diligence, in a high-risk geography, I would say you have to do anti-corruption testing, not just a review of the program, but you actually have to test transactions. Tom, unfortunately, we are near the end of time for this episode, but I was wondering if our listeners wanted any more information on any of the topics you touched upon on this episode, where can they go? Please visit us at k2integrity.com um, or check out LinkedIn or Twitter at k2integrity. Tom, I greatly look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks, Tom. Me too. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you for listening to this episode of this special five-part podcast series sponsored by K2 Integrity. For more information, check out K2 Integrity's website at www.k2integrity.com. I hope you will join us again for another episode in this special five-part series. This podcast series is a special production of the Compliance Podcast Network.